grammatical context or rule or principle. And um, we are seeing the Bible is a book, right? As a matter of fact, the Greek word for Bible is Biblos, which really means what? The book, right? So when you are talking about Bible, it is from that Greek word, Biblos, which is the word meaning the book. So it is a book. Now, failure to understand that occasions a lot of hermeneutical problems. I was preaching with um, a friend of mine called Joshua Bolaji, <laughs> very good man. <coughs> He's a guy who has done his degrees in some other fields and he says when he came to the Bible he failed to understand how to interpret the Bible primarily because he felt the Bible was not a book and sometimes that is the thinking we approach the Bible with we look at the Bible from a mysterious point of view we think of it as this ethereal, um, in the air sort of thing. And that is why some people even use the Bible as a pillowcase. Because they think there is some kind of power that can come out and diffuse itself somehow in the mind. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Peter Masters has written a book, Dr. Peter Masters, and he called that book, talking about the Bible, he called it not like any other book. It is true. The Bible is not like any other book, but it is a book. You know, when scripture talks, for example, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, this what? Book of the law. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. This book of the Lord. It is a book. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 to 7. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 to 7. When he comes into the world, he says, Offering and sacrifice you have not desired. But the body you have prepared for me to do your will, O God, as it is written, where? In the volume of the book. So the Bible is a book, isn't it? Yes. We are told in the days of the restoration of the temple that one of the things that inspired the reforms of King Josiah was a discovery of what? The book of the law. The Bible is a book. Now you also understand, that's number one. Number two, you also understand that the Bible was written in human languages. Is that correct? Uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and so on and so forth. In fact, even in the translations that come to us, they come to us in different languages, Latin, Luya, Luo, Kikuyu, Kamba, Meru, and, and, and so on and, and so forth. So it is a book written in human language. What this means, therefore, is that the Bible will inevitably, inevitably, necessarily, as a must, it will be comprised of something we call grammar. Because human languages are constructed by grammar. Isn't that true? I mean, 
those of us who went at least to class four, at least to class four, would understand something of the English grammar. There are verbs and adverbs, there are nouns and pronouns, there are you know, prepositions and there are idioms and there are figures of speech in terms of the way language operates. You cannot understand, for example, the language in the Bible, the message of the Bible, away from its grammar. Away from its language and its constructions. It's very important. So we talk of grammar as a principle of biblical interpretation, all right? Grammar. The way languages are structured, the way they are developed, the way they are constructed, and the way they are used. Grammar becomes very, very important, absolutely important in understanding the Bible. Now then, having said what I have just said, we have several things to discuss under uh, the rule of grammar, or what we call the grammatical principle or grammatical rule, we have something that we call word study. Because remember, language is formed by words. Is that right? Yes. Words. 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 Form language. Without words, you have no language. And by the way, how do we understand each other other than body expressions than the use of language? Use of language. Words. You can only know my thinking if I use what? <coughs> words. If I don't use words, you cannot understand my thinking. When God wanted us to understand his mind, he used what? Words. Now the point I'm making here is that words are important. Words are important. Every word written in the Bible is important. Because words are meaningful. Words carry meaning. Words carry thoughts. Words carry ideas. So we are concerned with the meaning of words as they are used. We are very, very concerned with the meaning of words as they are used. Words as they are used carry meaning for us. So if I come to a text of scripture, to a passage in the Bible, to a verse in a chapter, I must be asking myself, this word that I'm looking at here, what does it actually mean? What study? Now, I often use examples to illustrate this point. And here is one of those examples that I use. When you think about, say, um, let, let me just find Go to Galatians chapter 5. Let, let's, let's see if we can illustrate this by way of uh, an example. In Galatians chapter 5.
Somebody read for me verse 19. It says that <clears throat> now what is flesh that word is funny now works we can understand very quickly but what does the word flesh mean can somebody help you with that because what you're doing now is to engage in word study yes Zainab okay so Zainab says body Flesh means body, yes? Sinful what? Sins cannot be flesh, can they? Sin, you're right, but sinful what? Sinful what? Thank you. Now, Zainab, do you see that when you read that, you are reading it with Asogesis. There is an understanding you have of the word flesh, which you're bringing where? <coughs> to Galatians chapter 5. Alright? Because you're looking at flesh, which is an English word, means what? This that we see. Flesh. So you have that in your mind. It's the understanding you have. You bring that to the Bible. That is what I refer to as what? Asogesis. But now, Zainab, look at it again. Now, you're right. Let's just help Zainab. And when I say Zainab, I mean those of you who are thinking like her. All right? Now, when he says the acts of or the works of the flesh are obvious. Well, witchcraft, for example, is not really done by this, really. Witchcraft is something spiritual, isn't it? Um, <coughs> hatred. Hatred is not something that you do with your bones and nyama, yeah? this flesh. Hatred is something that is in the heart. Can you even touch hatred? You can't touch it, but it's listed as one of the works of the flesh. So you begin to see, if you only read more, remember context? If you only read more, you begin to question your understanding and say, no, that cannot be right, isn't it? So the right answer there would be, sinful nature. The works of the sinful nature are, and then they begin to be listed. Now, I can understand that by looking at the context, all right? I can understand that by looking at the context. Um, if I went to verse 17, I would see that it is desires uh, which are contrary to the spirit, isn't it? They are contrary to the spirit. The spirit is holy, those are not holy. I would begin to find hell in terms of context. If I went to verse 20 and 21, I would begin to see that there are some items there that don't, are not done by this flesh that I can touch. If I go to verse 22, I would see the opposite of those and they are attitudes and feelings and reactions. Now, so now, one way of understanding a word is by looking at the context, right? We've done it. But there's a second way of looking at a word and its meaning, and that has to use other tools which we have. For example, if you understood a little Greek, just a little, and by the way, these days there are programs. I have one in my phone here. I can tap it and it gives me the Greek equivalent of all those words. All right? Those things are now available. Really, interpreting scripture is becoming even easier by the day. If you understood Greek, and let me just tap that from my sort of Greek 
Bible so that I can actually give you the word and then make an explanation. So if you don't have these tools, don't worry, look at context. Many times it will give you an idea, not a full idea, but some idea. But then there will still be some things that you have to grapple with. Uh, chapter 5, was it Galatians? And we are looking at verse 19, yes? So I'm just going to tap Greek. And here I am. The word for flesh there is the Greek word sarx. That's what you have there. Okay? There is another Greek word. Soma. I see him. I'm sorry. Okay. But Soma. Now, in the Greek language, when this is used, both of these are sometimes translated what? Flesh in our English. You see where we are? We have a problem. In the Greek, they are different. Even in the Greek Bible, alright? But in our translation, only one word. That's why something that can go wrong. Alright? But look at it this way. When scripture uses that word, which is what is there in Galatians 5.19, it refers to sinful nature. Cannot be seen. Cannot be touched. That is what it's referring to. But when it uses this word here, it is referring to body. Alright? Can be seen. Can be touched. Now, this is not sinful. With this body, I can shake the hand of my brother. That's a good thing, isn't it? Soma. But with this body, the other one, I can hurt my brother. The Greek separates the words. English sometimes doesn't. You see the problem? So that is why I told you yesterday, we have to study how we might go back to the Greek. Because our languages are limited. Does this make sense? Hermeneutics is technical, so let's have technical mind. Like I told you, this is hard work. Now, if Zainab, forgive me Zainab, if Zainab had been preaching to some women, some place or whatever she's doing, and then she interpreted Galatians 5.19 in this way, would she still be preaching God's word? See, that's the point. Yet she read of us. The word flesh is there. But she won't be preaching God's word. She'll be preaching a mistake. Word, study. Study the words. Look at the words. Because scripture comes to us by means of words. 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 Words are meaningful. It's another word we frequently talk about, and it is the word world, world, world. For God so loved what? Aha. Uh -huh. But then we are told that is John three sixteen. But when you go to the letter of John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, we are told, do not love the world. Now I'm confused. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world. Are we talking about the same world here? Do you think? 
Not at all. The one world is to be loved. <laughs> the other world is not to be loved. But the word is the same. World. Now you see again, our English only has that one word to translate what in the Greek are very different words. In the Greek, you will be talking about cosmos, universe, all right? That which we can touch, we can see, we live in it, we stand on it, we eat from it by digging. But the Greek can also talk about aeon. All right? Which is a period of time, very large period of time. For example, then when he says, and I shall be with you to the very end of the world, or the age, the word is eon, to the very end of time itself. So this refers to earth, this refers to time. Is that right? But then there is the word world, which refers to people. For example, in Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord, the world and all in it, you see? Earth, world. The earth is the Lord, the world and all in it. So the world becomes a big number of people, isn't it? You read many times in the Gospels, the whole world has gone after him. Well, the people from India and Kenya go after him at once. It simply talks about a large group of people. So do you see the word world can be used in at least eight different ways in the Bible. So for you to properly interpret a verse, you're going to say, how has this word been used here? So you've got context and you've got word study. So important. Because again, scripture comes to us through what? Words. And words are important. Don't just throw words in the air because you read them. You may have misread them. That is what we call what? Word study. We'll be concerned with it. We'll be concerned with it. Any question there? Yes. Yes, you say that. Uh, is it Titus? Um, Titus. Yes. You say that word in Greek word in Greek language it mm. is cosmos, ion, and people. No, there is another five, which is not my business. I'm not really going to. And it's not a letter on the word world. I'm using that as an example, so I'm not going to go through all of them. No. Sorry. Now again, let me impress upon you that there has to be a way in which we treat scripture seriously. Don't just read and go, because you'll be misrepresenting God while thinking you are preaching. So James says, let there be few teachers, because judgment will be strict on the teachers. Right. So what study? Very, very important. Now, that's not the only thing we're looking at when we are talking about language and its construction. Are we there? Language also does use what we call figures of what? Of speech. Figures of speech. Figures of speech. Now, often when we deal with texts of the Bible, we fail to realize that the Bible, like any other language, uses figures 
of speech. Figures of speech. The Bible uses figures of speech. Now, what are figures of speech? You think? Anybody wants to help me with that? What are figures of speech? Yep. Parts of speech. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. No, parts of speech, yes, it's true. Uh, but what particularly are they? What are these parts of speech? Those are not really figures of speech. No, no. Figures of speech would be those styles of speech which we often use to enrich speech. Okay? They are styles that are extra to normal speech. You know, I can talk to you in a normal language, without style, without spices. It will be very boring kind of talk. Um, I could say something like, my brother, my wife, who pushed out of her womb seven of my children has died. She has lost her breath. Well, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, don't you? But it's really rather crude. It's very crude, isn't it? And very unpalatable. It's not nice. It's... But on the other hand, I can say, my dear brother, my better half. See what I'm saying? Uh, who blessed me with seven wonderful children has slept, for example. My dear brother, my better half who has blessed me with seven children has slept. It's very polite. It's very nice to the ears. There's the first sentence, no figures of speech. It's flat, it's blunt, very hard to the ears, very hard to the mind. Then there's a second one with figures of speech in it. Figures of speech are those tiles which we use to enrich, to sweeten language to make language better, even to enhance meaning. Every language does that, doesn't it? Every language has a way of sweetening uh, speech and making them more acceptable. Every language. In the Bible, that is also true. The trouble is sometimes we interpret in the Bible a figure of speech in very funny ways. And so we must understand that there are figures of speech in the Bible. For example, the Bible uses such things as similes. 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 S-I-M-I-L-E-S. -I similes. You don't say similes or similes. No, you say similes. Similes. This is when we use comparative... Um, we compare two things by using the word... What? As or like. When we use those two words, we're actually using a figure of speech which is called what? Simile. 
or similes. Uh, I could say this 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 drink is as cold as ice. Alright? Or um this porridge is hot like what? So I'm comparing the porridge with the other thing by using the word as or like. As black as a charcoal. See me. Now, when I say this brother here is as black as a charcoal, am I calling him charcoal? No, I'm not. I'm just trying to emphasize his blackness by comparing it to the charcoal. When you use the word as and like, you are employing a figure of speech, a stylistic device that is called simile. Now you studied that in school. It's true of the Bible. For example, in First John, so not first John, it's 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 first Peter. First Peter, first Peter, chapter five. First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, I think. This should be verse. Second bit, not first bit, second, I'm sorry. Second bit. What? Where's this text? <laughs> All right. First Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. First Peter 5, verse 8. Somebody read me that one. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, mm. as a roaring lion, mm. walketh about seeking whom to he may gather. Did you see any of these words in that verse? Yes. Which one did you see? Thanks. Us or like. Mine will use the word like. like. Yours is the word us. But what two things are being compared there? Correct. So the scripture is not saying the devil is a lion. It's not saying that. Alright? It is only comparing the activity of Satan with the roaring of a lion. Now. I'm sort of trying to organize something as well. Okay, so I want you to also uh, see something like, um, uh, where is this, where is this, um, I want to find one more. Similarly again in scripture, so many of them, some of them just can't come to my head now. Mm, the devil like a roaring lion. Anyway, leave it alone. You, you get the point, don't you? Mm -hmm. When you use the word like or us, you're simply comparing. In fact, this is what I wanted to say. Go to Matthew chapter 3. And I want to show you this because I always want to illustrate something with a, 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 an example that we can visualize. 
This way. Chapter 3, verse 16. No. Are you in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16? And Jesus. Yeah. No, let her read, please. And Jesus, when he was baptized, mm. went up immediately out of the water, mm. and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lightning upon him. Lighting on him. Lighting upon him. Okay. Do you see a simile there? Now this is a very funny verse. Because every time people represent the Holy Spirit, they usually draw a bird with some wings. And that's a bird for me. <laughs> it's, I mean, so that in fact we have this mental picture of the Holy Spirit being like a dove. I want you to look at that verse and see how easy it is to miss the point. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw what? Jesus saw the Spirit. Not other people seeing the Spirit. Who saw the Spirit? Jesus. Well, 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 well. If it's Spirit, how could it be seen? Because by definition, a spirit cannot So obviously Jesus was not looking with the eyes we are looking with. He could see the spirit because he was able to see the spirit. Now keep going. I want to show you something. Descending what? What's the next one? Like a dove. It is not the spirit who is compared to a dove, it is the descending that is compared to that of a dove. The way a dove descends. The comparison is not between the spirit and the bird, it is between the descending of the spirit and the descending of a bird. Does that make sense? But people, when they hear of the Holy Spirit, they think of a bird. They even draw it. <laughs> no. Church of the Holy Spirit, then there's a dove. The idea. That's idolatry, actually. You shall not make images, Scripture says in Exodus chapter 20. But again, what failure is there but failure of humanities? So if you checked 316, you will discover. The comparison is not between the spirit and the dove, but the descending of the dove and the descending of the spirit. As a matter of fact, people didn't uh, see it's Christ who saw them. Are we together? So I just wanted to have an illustration also of a mistake that arises when you fail to see what a simile functions like. Is, does that make sense? Does it? All right. So then the next one, which we are dealing with, is something we call a metaphor. A metaphor. Metaphor. Now this is so similar to a simile that sometimes people treat them as one. Because a simile compares two things, all right? A metaphor also compares two things or more. While a simile uses the words as or like, a metaphor doesn't use those words. Though it is comparing two things, a metaphor will call one thing, another, in order to compare them. Now, I say a metaphor will call one thing by the name of another with an intention to compare them. 
Um, let me think of one now. The one I'm thinking about is um, my brother. You are a boon because I saw you working. You know, I saw you working on your farm. I said, hey, brother, you are a boon. <coughs> well, am I saying this brother is a cow? No. But do you understand what I'm trying to say? I'm saying he's very strong. He's powerful. Like a bull. But if I said like, I'll be using a simile. But when I'm using a metaphor, I'm actually calling him the name of the thing to which I'm comparing him with. You are a bull, my brother. Well, I don't mean him to think, Pastor, is, is this what you think about me? No. He should be happy that I praised him, isn't it? Yes. In the Bible, we are told of the lion of the tribe. Now, do we have a four-legged animal with a lot of men sort of prowling around? Is that our savior? No. But our savior is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is compared to the lion by being called a lion. Not us or like. Now listen, again, you see pictures of a lion drawn, sometimes even in terms of calendars and all, isn't it? Yes. A lion is drawn with a crown of thorns. Have you seen a picture like that? Mm -hmm. They intend us to think that is who? Mm -hmm. Tell me if that's what I do not Again, where does that come from? It comes from a metaphor that the Bible uses. The Bible is comparing Jesus with a lion, not making Jesus the lion. If you draw a picture of a lion and intend us to see Jesus in that picture, you're committing idolatry. Because you're making an image and calling it Christ. You must never do that. Is that it? How many of you have those pictures of uh, this Arab man with some yellow light? It's called a halo around him and a heart that is outside, and there's a spear across that heart. And that <coughs> Arab man is doing this. If I come to some of your houses, it's there. <laughs> it's idolatry, my friends. It's an abomination to God. It's repulsive to God. Whenever I go to houses of members of our church, if I see that, I don't even ask. Mm -hmm. I go up and I pull it down. <laughs> That's what I do. I went to a church someplace. I was doing a lecture in a church hall. And right in front of me, there was a lady there. I think they wanted that lady to be married, carrying a baby. And then besides that, there was this Arab man with they want us to think it's Jesus and I said to them people I don't have authority in this church but please as long as I'm lecturing would you kindly remove those things you'll put them when I'm done <laughs> because it's idolatry yes are you following so when we're using metaphor, we are comparing things by calling them the same name. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Make sense that one? Very good. But we sometimes also use a figure of speech we call irony. Irony. Who understands what an irony is? Help me understand this. Um, you say you are good when mm -hmm. you are you are trying to love. You mean what you are not meaning? 
You can never mean what you're not meaning. You are saying what you don't mean, I think. But you can never mean what you don't mean. Like, I understand that. Yes. Of course, yes, it is. That's what you mean. It is when I speak, but I intend you to understand the opposite. Or I mean the opposite. Um, I'll tell you what. I struggle with my wife sometimes, all right? It's not, it's all right. I have a few problems sometimes. And maybe she acts in a way that takes my authority as a man in the house, all right? Maybe she acts in that way. And then I'll say something like, well, madam, you're the man in this house. You're the man. You're the man. Well, should she go? Okay, yes. <laughs> now, she must never do that. She must understand me saying, you are actually a woman, but now you're pretending to be a man. You know? So I mean the opposite of what I'm saying. That's irony. Ironic language. It is very close to another figure of speech, which we call sarcasm. Sarcasm. And sarcasm is when I'm actually trying to speak something positive when you have deserved negative. So I'm being sarcastic. It's close to irony, right? You know, for example, uh, you've displayed a lot of uh, not very intelligent kind of talk. You're not displaying a lot of intelligence. And I say to you, hmm, bro, that's very smart of you. That's very smart of you. It's I irony, but it's also sarcastic. Kejeli, right? Very close, those two, so we can treat them as one. Now, why are we talking about this? We are talking about this because in the Bible, this style is used. Now, let me just see if I can pull out one example. Again, illustrations are like what? Windows to a dark room. They let in the light. Look at 2 Corinthians. Let's see if we can find it there. <laughs> chapter 11, verse 1. 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 1. Now, hear the words of the Apostle Paul. Here it is, 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. I hope you will put up with a little of my foolishness. But you already do it. Is Paul saying he's foolish? Well, that's what he's saying. The question is, does he mean that? Because what he's trying to tell them is the word of God himself, isn't it? But he's saying, just put up with me with my little foolishness. Well, he's being sarcastic, isn't it? You people in Corinth, you think you're smart. Isn't it? That's what he's trying to tell them. You think you're... But there's a preacher who will take this verse and say, brothers and sisters, those of us who are very foolish, don't be worried. Even Paul was foolish. <laughs> I mean, you can hear somebody preach like that. Yeah. Be encouraged. Even Paul was very foolish. So, and they're preaching. Well, is that what Paul is saying? Well, he's saying that, but is that what he means? So you need to understand that there is irony and sarcasm in the Bible. 
for you to understand. Let me see if he, <coughs> he has more. And you have to understand it. Otherwise, you misinterpret it. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you, or exploits you, or takes advantage of you, or pushes himself forward, or slaps you in the face. Hmm. Oh, what are you saying? Verse 21. To my shame. Well, 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 Paul. What are you ashamed of? To my shame, I admit. <laughs> that we were too weak for that. This doesn't sound right. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. What anyone else dares to boast about, okay, what anyone else dares to boast, the, the comparison is, there were people who were saying they were super apostles, and Paul was, you know, mutu ya kawaida. And so Paul is saying, we are too weak to defend ourselves there. But what Paul is trying to tell them is, if you looked at my record, I have worked more than all of those super apostles. If you look at my fruit, I have planted more churches than them, but we are ashamed, he says. Well, it doesn't mean they're ashamed. He's telling them, you should be ashamed of yourselves. That's what he's trying to say. By saying, we are ashamed, he's telling them, you should be ashamed. For even thinking, so can you see that style there? So again, don't go preaching and say, you know, even Paul himself was ashamed because he was very weak. He's not saying he was weak here. It must be the opposite. Can you see that? All right. And then he begins to talk about his credentials. Uh, So that's, that's, that's really it there. You've got to understand there are sarcasm, there is irony, all right? This will become very clear also when you deal with things like 1 Corinthians 14, for example. In fact, the whole chapter seems to be cast in the irony a kind of way, uh, but we, we will deal with that another time. Here's another one you need to consider. We talk of hyperbole. 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 Again, you don't say hyperbole. Right? You say hyperbole. Hyperbole. H Y P E R B O L E. Now again, it's normal sometimes when we speak. We speak like this. We say, Edith, even if you cry tears of blood, I will not give you those grades you want. I will not. Even if you cry tears. Well, dear friends, am I saying she sometimes cries tears of blood? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to emphasize my point. I'm trying to make it strong, make it firm, by appealing to the impossible. Even if you could do the impossible, which you can't do, Still, I would not do this for you. So the point is, I'm trying to emphasize what I will not do by saying even if she did the impossible. When I do that, I'm engaging in hyperbole. It is exaggerating a thing in order to make a point. That's hyperbole. Exaggerating a thing in order to make 
a point. Brother, even if you walk with your head from here to Kakamega, I'm not giving you my phone. Well, is it possible for this brother to walk on his head from here to Kakamega? No. That's an impossible. But I'm referring to it to make him see how strong my decision is. I'm exaggerating a point or a thing in order to make a point. That's very important. And scripture, again, to illustrate the point, you have things like that in scripture. For example, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. See if we can have an example here of what a hyperbole looks like. Yes. Says, mm -hmm. even, even if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I'm not love, I am the most gone or a planting symbol. Planting symbol. Okay. Now wait, 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 Paul. If I speak in the tongues of men, and of what? Angels. Well, Paul, I'm confused. What are these tongues of angels? Did we see angels come in the Bible? No, of course we did. Have angels appeared to people in the Bible? Yes. Many times. An angel appeared to Abraham in Genesis 22. An angel appeared to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. An angel appeared to Manoah and his wife in Judges 13. An angel appeared to Mary in Luke chapter 1. An angel appeared to Peter in Acts chapter 12. Angels have appeared time and again in the Bible. And every time angels have appeared in the Bible, they have spoken the tongues of men. Yes. Abraham could hear what the angel was telling him. Gideon could understand the language of the angel was speaking in. So what are these tons of angels? As a matter of fact, when we are given a glimpse into heaven in um, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, for example, we are given a glimpse into the heavenly worship and the angels are worshiping. What are they saying? Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah is able to understand that and to tell us what they're saying. What are the language of angels? The answer is, it doesn't exist. But what Paul is doing here is to engage in hyperbole. He's saying, even if you could speak a language that doesn't appear among men, if you don't have love, that will still be useless. So again, he's exaggerating a thing in order to make a point. Now, I know people who have told me that they have the gift of the language of angels. <laughs> they speak not just the tongues of men. Those tongues of yours are very low. They speak the tongues of angels. Hmm. Good for you. It doesn't exist. That's the point. But Paul is using hyperbole. Now, again, look at, just to make that point clearer, look at verse 2. If I have the gift of what? Prophecy. And can understand what? All mysteries and all what? No, 
Is that possible? Who on this earth can understand all mysteries and have all knowledge? Is there any human being who can have that? See, that's the point. It's impossible. By the way, if you have all mysteries and all knowledge, you become God yourself. Because only God knows everything. But again, Paul here is appealing to the impossible in order to make a point. That style is called hyperbole. All right. Then there is a style we commonly refer to as personification. 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 When you're dealing with personification, you're really dealing with uh, just like that word means person. Um, you are giving personal attributes to impersonal objects. You are giving personal attributes to impersonal objects. Now, there is sometimes we say something like um, Yama, hata kama mawe ya ngelizungumza. Ah, some, you know, we, we say, we say, these walls, had they been talking, they would have given testimony of what I'm saying. Because the walls were there when you were saying what you were saying, isn't it? And sometimes you wish the walls were people. <laughs> well, in the Bible sometimes, things like trees are given personal attributes. Mountains and rivers are sometimes given personal attributes. And we read things like, and the mountains will leap for joy. Well, the mountains will leap for joy. What kind of language is this? And some of us do actually look at a period in time when mountains will be dancing, really. <laughs> No, it will never happen. This is scripture using a language, using a style called personification. Uh, there's this experience when Christ is coming into Jerusalem and the masses erupt in <coughs> song and praise of him and the disciples uh, and actually, the Pharisees say, no, look, uh, they're making noise. Ask them to be quiet. And Jesus says, if they would be silent, the stones will cry out. Well, can stones cry? But they're being given personal what? Attitudes. Jesus is communicating. He's saying, I'm able to do anything. That's what he's saying. Then there is something else I'll show you. One, two, three, four, five. E, F. Allegorization or allegory. <coughs> Allegorization or allegory. Now, an allegory is a story. Where every thing or character has a hidden meaning. An allegory is a story in which every thing, every character has a hidden what meaning.
Das ist eine Lego. Everything, every character in the story has a hidden what? Meaning. How many of you have read The Pilgrim's Progress? Here. Safari and Safari. You know, it's, it's actually funny. It's, 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 it's a very popular book in the world, next to the Bible, actually. And uh, written by John Banyan. Uh, it's actually a shame we haven't read it. Huh? No, it's not adventures. It's just the pilgrim's progress. Safari and Safari in Swahili. It's called. <coughs> the story is like there was a man called Christian who was on a journey to the celestial city. On his way, he met Mr. Doubt. Mr. Doubt. And they began to talk. And then he met Mr. Encouragement. Well, these characters have meanings, don't they? It's a story with many sides, many characters, and every part, every side has a meaning. That's an allegory. And when you're looking at an allegory, you need to interpret the allegory. You need to think, what is the meaning of this character here? What is the meaning of this character there? Now, one of those allegories is found in Judges, I think, chapter 9. Judges chapter 9. What is it? Let me just see, let me just see, let me just see. Okay. Say that again. Are we in chapter 10 or verse 10? Chapter 9, verse? Uh huh. Next, the kings say to the people. Thank you, thank you, that's it. <laughs> Actually, chapter 9, from verse 7. When Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day, and then he starts to say a story, one day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. Now, this is interesting. What other style do you see there, other than Lego? What style do you see there? What figure of speech do you see? Come on, come on now. Say that again. What style do you see? I've already talked about it. Personification. Well, trees cannot speak, but they're, they're given speech, aren't they? They're given personal attributes. Um, so one day, the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They say to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree answered, should I give up my oil, by which both gods and men are honored to hold sway over the trees. Next, the tree said to the fig tree, and the story goes on, trees are being asked and they refuse, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a meaning, isn't there? Eventually, which tree accepts? Verse 14. Which tree accepts? The vine refused. The olive tree refused, the whatever, these big, beautiful, honorable trees refused the job. So which one accepts? The bramble. The bramble. Or the thorn bush, as they say. Finally, verse 14, all the trees say to the thorn bush or the bramble, come be our king. And the bramble say to the trees, <coughs> if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shed. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Blah, 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 blah. So anyway, the point is, the big, honored, respected trees refuse the job. 
the least honored, the least respected, the useless tree accepted the job. Surely there's a hidden meaning there, isn't there? And that hidden meaning you find it in chapter 11. When the sons of who? Say that again. You know Jephthah and his brothers? Jephthah was the son of a prostitute. Despised. Remember his brothers chased him from the home, saying we cannot, you cannot share an inheritance with us while you are a son of a prostitute. Despised one. Rejected one. Then, when they were stuck and they, were, went to, they wanted to go to war, who did they go to? Jephthah. Because Jephthah was a strong man in war. And so the despised one ruled over them. The stone that the builders rejected has become... That's the message in there. So that's an allegory, a story with different parts. The other trees represented the other brothers. This bramble represented Jephthah. And so on and so forth. So you interpret an allegory like that. Every part has a meaning. And for you to understand the whole message, you've got to understand the parts. But there's something else that is as close to the allegory. It's called a parable. You find that also in the Bible, a parable. Now, you cannot interpret a parable the way you interpret an allegory. Remember, an allegory is a story in which every part, every, has a meaning, hidden, isn't it? In a parable, it is a story which may have many parts, but there is only one meaning in the end. There is no multiplicity of meanings, there is only one meaning in the end. And who was very famous for using parables in the Bible? Jesus. Our Lord himself is. So it seems to me that for you to understand the Gospels, really, there's a sense in which you must be able to figure out the parables. In uh, Luke chapter 15, there's a story of who? Or the parable of who? Yeah? Go there, go there. Verse 3, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, then goes on the same way, and blah, 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 blah. There's a parable there. <coughs> but again, there's only one meaning, isn't there? What's the meaning? Tell me. What's the meaning? Again, context will help you. So tell me the meaning of that parable. I think he was talking about his father. No, look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. I'll help you. Look at verse 2. here. What has he been accused of? Because he's giving a parable in response to an accusation. So what's the accusation? That's right. That's the accusation. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's the accusation. So he responds. Then Jesus told them this parable. So the parable is a response to the accusation. Well, there are many of you who seem good, right? A 
good shepherd will leave the 99 and go for this one, which is not like, for example, here the prostitutes. So the point here is that for the sake of one sinner, Christ is willing to leave the rest, the 99. That's the point. And, and you don't need to bring a big revelation. That's what Jesus is saying. That's all. All right? Look at Luke chapter 18. Go to chapter 18 then. Jesus often spoke in parables. Verse 2. In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because th this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the just judge says. Tell me the meaning of that parable. Always the meaning of the parable will be in the context. And it is one. So show, show me the meaning of that parable. <coughs> yes? Thank you very much. Where did you get that? From verse, verse 1. Verse 1! In fact, thank you brother. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable. Why? To show them that they should always that's the meaning of the parable why should you pray without ceasing here's the parable there was a lady who wanted justice she asked without ceasing she got answers then look at verse what verse 7 and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night will he keep putting them off so you see, then context, the end in verse 7, the beginning in verse 1, gives you the key to interpret. So if we're go I'm going to speak about prayer, isn't this a lovely text to use? It's a wonderful text because the Lord himself is speaking about prayer, uses this text. To the intent that men ought always to pray and not to cease. So don't preach every part of a parable. Okay? <clears throat> Read the whole parable, then ask yourself, what is the main meaning? Preach that main meaning. Because parables always have one big meaning. The rest is to help this meaning become clear. The problem is some of us preach what helps the meaning, and then we leave the meaning. It's a shame, isn't it? Are we okay? Let's take a break there, and then when you come back, we should continue some more. Is that all right? Thank you. Take a break.